how's it going? This is Pete Yozzi. I'm an editor of Epigenie, and today we welcome you to the Bite Size Bio Web Seminar, which is sponsored by New England Bio Labs, a world leader in the production and supply of reagents for the life science industry. NEB now offers the largest selection of recombinant native enzymes for genomic research and continues to expand its product offerings to emerging areas, including proteomics, drug discovery, and epigenetics. If you'd like more information, you can visit them at www.neb.com. Today's presentation is titled Locus Specific and Genome 5 Prime Hydroxymethylcytosine Detection and Quantification. And it will be presented by Dr. Shurhasa Pradhan, who is the division head of RNA biology at NEB. As always, we'll have a Q&A session after the uh, end of the talk. So please submit throughout the course of the talk. When you have any kind of questions, please submit them in the questions box which will appear in the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll uh, consolidate them and tee them up to Shrihasa at the end of the presentation. So on that note, I'll turn things over to Shrihasa for the presentation. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so uh, today's webinar is going to uh, be specifically focused on our newest uh, reagents as well as some of the science that we do at New England BioLab to detect the global as well as local specific 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, uh, which, which is a epigenetic mark in the mammalian genome. So let me introduce to you what is epigenetics in a very layman version. So if you look what epigenetics is, this is exactly the study of heritable changes in the phenotype of a cell or organism that are not dictated by the genome per se. Now, let me, let me explain this to you in a little bit more clarity here. So if you look into the molecular basis of epigenet epigenetics, what you see is a, is a chromosome. And this chromosome, if you take, uh, take a tweezer and try to drag a little bit from the side of the chromosome, you are unraveling the chromatin fiber. These chromatin fibers are essentially the nucleosome particles which are uh, like bead and strings, and they actually uh, form the uh, primary structure of the chromatin. This, if you unravel, if you take out the proteins, what you see is the double-stranded DNA. And on the double-stranded DNA, you will see various kind of modification that occurs. And one of the predominant modification is the methylation of the DNA, as is depicted as a ME here. So apart from DNA methylation, if you look into chromatin, there is also a histone component, or which I was referring as the nucleosomes here. And this histone and DNA, they together make the nucleosome, the basic subunit of the chromatin. And when DNA can be methylated or unmethylated in two different forms, it can exist. However, histone is a little bit more complicated. Histone have this beautiful tails that jots out from the nucleosome core particles. And these tails can be modified in a variety of ways, such as methylated, uh, and it could be uh, monodi or trimethylated. Then acetylation can occur, so as some of the marks also could be removed by acetylation, so which is known as deacetylation and phosphorylation. And what, for example, I am showing you a histone H3 tail here. And you can see that there are various amino acids that are getting modified here. For example, lysine 4 on histone H3 uh, uh, tail can be modified by a variety of enzymes, uh, and which are like set 7, set 9. And these enzymes can put specific methyl mark, and that methyl mark can be removed by LSD1 uh, uh, type of uh, demethylases. So, uh, so essentially, the modification mark is very reversible. So histone can stay in a very dynamic stage where uh, the, for certain biological function, a modification can be put in, and certain function, it can be removed. However, if you look into broadly ask the question, what's the difference between genome versus epigenome, and why is it important? Uh, so if you look into a cell, you'll know that genome is generally very consistent however epigenome changes. What I mean by consistent is essentially the basic subunit of the genome, that's a nucleotide sequence, they don't really change until and unless there's a mutation. But however, the epigenome can change 
or the modification on your genome that can change with age, diet, various kind of disease, your lifestyle, or the environmental impact. So that leads us to understand, uh, put a huge number of biological interest here because epi studying epigenome or studying epigenetics can actually lead us to understand molecular basis of diseases. We can also think about in a more uh, applied manner where the biomarker identification could, uh, uh, could be the result of studying epigenomic changes or diagnostic development as well as drug targeting. So essentially what we believe is that you, if you sequence your genome once, you know the nucleotide sequence, but to understand the epigenetic changes which is accompanied with age, diet, disease, or lifestyle, you need to determine your epigenome multiple times over the lifespan of an organism. So, um, so what is this modification of DNA? Now, we all know that there are four basic uh, building blocks on DNA, which are four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C. And now, what happens to the C, or which is known as, which I have made a figure here as a deoxycytogen, this can actually modify uh, by three enzymes that are present in most of the uh, organism like human, mouse, uh, all kinds of mammals. So these are called DNA methylase methyl transferase. These are essentially cytosine specific methyl transferase, DNA methyl transferase 1, 3A, and 3B. So what these enzymes they can do is essentially they take a S adenosine methionine or automate and put a methyl groups on the fifth carbon position, and the net product, automet, will be converted to autohis, and you get a methyl group right on the fifth carbon position of the cytosine ring. Now, this is, for the longest time, we thought that this is a very stable mark, and it really doesn't change very much, and this is our epigenetic blueprint. But very recently, about two, three years ago, there are some some very nice scientific discovery where people found this, a group of iron-dependent enzyme, they're called 10-11 translocation factor, one, two, and another one recently known also three. These, these all enzymes, they can actually take this methyl group on the fifth carbon position and oxidize it to 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Uh, and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine has uh, come to the picture recently as another epigenetic mark on the genome. So we are talking about the fifth base as methylcytosine, sixth base as 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And that is also latest uh, observation that this residue can also further oxidize to formal and carboxyl group. But those two modifications are not in our current discussion. So we will focus our uh, emphasis on understanding how to interrogate hydroxymethylcytosine on the genome. So uh, what does the exact role of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine? I mean, we, we have enough of evidence now to speculate that this can be a part of the demethylation protocol during, uh, during mammalian development or gene expression, so it could be a very transitory mark. Uh, so if anything is associated with methylation and demethylation, that will have a profound influence on the gene expression. So that will essentially dictate whether the gene should be transcriptionally remain active or repressive. And now, as we know, that this 5-hydroxymethylcytosine molecule is actually very enriched in the brain. Basically, about 30% of the methylcytosine in the brain is 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So neuronal cells are highly enriched in 5-hydroxymethylcytosine, and embryonic cells are about 10% of their methylcytosine as 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So obviously, they do play a significant role during function and development of either brain or the embryonic stem cell. And also, we are aware that these uh, hydroxymethylcytosine uh, containing genes, they are mutated in acute myeloid leukemia, so that could be a function down there, and several other diseases. That brings a very interesting phenomenon, like all the hydroxymethylcytosine and the genes, uh, would they be participating in particular early biomarker for some of the disease and discovery phase? So maybe there is a role down there, but once again, this is 
very early in the science and a lot more to be discovered in the future. So what, if any, we have focused mostly in my group, as well as some of my collaborators, as well as uh, uh, other scientists, is how do you detect 5-hydroxymethylcytosine? And once you detect, how do you quantify that? Because if you have a particular locus, you really need to know uh, what percentage of your genomic DNA contains 5-hydroxymethylcytosine in that particular locus. So uh, in, in the good old traditional method, people have used uh, uh, antibody to pull down 5-methylcytosines and 5-hydroxymethylcytosine recently. But those technologies, they do not tell you the quantitative percentage. So we developed a protocol, which I'm going to describe here in a minute. Uh, before that, uh, that protocol is now packed into a kit format uh, where you essentially, a scientist will pick up the kit and try to ask what percentage of my locus has 5-hydroxymethylcytosine or 5-methylcytosine. It's a very user-friendly protocol. And it doesn't need any kind of extra equipment in the lab. It's a simple and robust method for identification and quantification of 5-HMC and 5-methylcytosine within a specific DNA locus. And this is highly reproducible. You can quantify it easily using a qPCR protocol uh, compatible with exist PCR te technique as well as it is uh, amenable for high throughput sequence analysis. So now let's look into the uh, method. So how does it work basically? If I'm telling you so many things, then I have to tell you how it exactly works. So one of the things is that if you look into a genomic DNA sample, you don't have just one strand of DNA. You have multiples uh, copy number of the genomic DNA in your uh, 50 nanogram or 100 nanogram of the samples. And that DNA in a particular site, for example, CCGG site, could be hydroxymethylated, could be methylated, or unmethylated. So you can only have three form here. The central CPG, as you know, most of the mammalian methylation occurs in CPG dinucleotide residues. So it could remain unmethylated, methylated, or hydroxymethylated format. Now, in the, in the, in the second step, what we do, we use an enzyme called uh, a phase-specific enzyme. It is called beta-glucosyl transferase. It's a from T4 phase, so it is known as T4 beta-glucosyl transferase, and we provide a substrate. So this glucosyl transferase will use the UDP glucose as a substrate and put a sugar residue on the hydroxymethylcytosine and make it glucosylated. So now your hydroxymethylcytosine residue is now glucosylated hydroxymethylcytosine. And this is a, this enzyme is there on T4 phase, and it regularly converts all the hydroxymethylcytosine to glucosyl hydroxymethylcytosine. I'll talk a little bit about the enzyme in the, in the second phase of my talk. So now this particular reaction pot, you are going to actually divide into three tubes, one, two, and three. And you can also decide to have a control, should you wish to have, so the control reaction without T4-beta-GT. You can put only the substrate here, and you can set them in an identical manner with four, five, and six reaction. For simplicity, I'm just going to focus on your experimental samples here. So the three tubes of reaction, now you are using a isoschizomer, these are restriction enzyme called MSP1 or HAPA2, or you can have an on-control, on-cut control. Now these enzymes, what they do, they recognize the CCGG sites for the, to digest it, but they have differential specificity when the DNA is methylated or hydroxymethylated. For example, all your uncut control DNA will have no sites missing because all the sites will remain intact because you are not putting any enzymes. But HAPA2 DNA, HAPA2 enzymes, when you put, it will only cut the unmethylated fraction of the genome. So it cuts everything that is CCGG. It will leave away every, anything that has a methyl group or a glucosyl uh, group. So this is essential, the hydroxyl group. However, MSP1, which will cut away the methyl group as well as the on-methyl group, it will leave away the glucosyl group. So now what you have essentially done in this particular part of the reaction is that you have actually left 
anything that was hydroxymethylated to start with. So anything that is hydroxymethylated is now remain intact. Anything that is uh, hydroxymethylated plus methylated is intact in the second part, and this is your 100% of the reaction. Now you can actually go for a quantitative PCR to find the percentage hydroxymethylated here, percentage all methylation, which is 5-methyl-C and 5-hydroxymethyl-C, and this is the total input. This is your 100%. And if you are looking at your favorite gene and asking a question, I want to do in a quick way to know whether my gene is hydroxymethylated or not, its reaction is simple. You just do an endpoint PCR, as I am showing in the left panel here. So this is a typical result using the kit. So essentially, on the top, we are writing about different kind of reaction component here. So T4 beta glucosal transferase plus means it is added into the tube, minus means it is not present in the tube. And you can see if you are asking a question, does my brain DNA has or test brain DNA has a particular locus methylated or not, you can just run an endpoint PCR. If you see the PCR product here, then you know that site is hydroxymethylated. Obviously, then if you do HAPA2, as you can see, it is methylated. This is 5-methyl cytosine as well as 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And what you could appreciate here is that the different DNA samples for the, that, that particular locus has different amount of hydroxymethyl cytosine. As you can see, liver DNA has lesser than brain DNA, whereas heart DNA has as good as brain DNA. So these are pretty enriched. DNA where hydroxymethyl cytosine is predominant, whereas splint DNA doesn't have. So this is just a positive and negative reaction where you do an endpoint PCR. But if you want to do know exactly what percentage of the sites are methylated or hydroxymethylated, then you have to rely on a quantitative PCR. And this is, again, a, a, again a, a representative data based on this particular endpoint PCR type of uh, the samples. So you can see, again, brain DNA has pretty high amount of 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine, heart DNA has, and as you can see, spleen was very little here, and so as in the uh, quantitative PCR, it is almost non-existent, very close to the background. So, so this is what the, the power of FEMARC 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine and 5-methyl cytosine analysis kit. And obviously, um, uh, the kit works very well on CPG methylated uh, DNA, which is essentially in human mouse and any kind of body bred DNA that you are talking about. We have used this kit and we have looked into various kind of uh, gene body uh, methylation as well as uh, uh, enhancer element, as well as uh, promoters and all different regions we have tried to ask the question. Does methylation and hydroxymethylation correlate in a gene body? So this is from the human brain DNA. These are the two genes called VAN-GL and EGFR genes. And this is the genomic, uh, 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 genomic map of these genes. And you can see the black boxes are exons and they're introns. And uh, there's on the top, the numbers of nucleotides are uh, annotated on the top. And as you can see that gene body methylation is very prevalent in this. So these are about nine sets of Q quantitative PCR reaction primer we are interrogating throughout the gene body. And as you can see that the blue bars are 5-methyl cytosine and the green bars are 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And you can see if, if you look into the uh, translation start site, set 1 and set 2, uh, sorry, transcription start site, you do not see any kind of methylation or hydroxymethylation, but in the gene body, you see a nice enrichment of both the marks. And the same thing with EGFR, you can see a nice enrichment of 5-methyl cytosine as well as 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine in the gene body, but once again, at the transcription start site, you do not see uh, anything happening. That is not absolutely very little amount of uh, modified basis. Now, where else can you use this kind of technology? Okay, if you are if you are using an antibody to do a whole genome uh, bisulfide, uh, whole genome analysis of 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine or 5-methyl cytosine by using immunoprecipitation technique or HME diff, that is known as, uh, you can validate your results. Suppose you see a lot of peaks that are coming up 
with your epimark uh, with your uh, antibodies and you want to really validate then you can use this kit as a result of this kind of application we actually looked into human embryonic stem cell and we found that enhancer elements are highly enriched in 5 hydroxymethylcytosine pig this is essentially hmed data and that corresponds to a lot of uh, activation marks like h3k4 monomethyl h3k27 acetyl marks so we wanted to know do the enhancer element really are enriched in 5 hydroxymethylcytosine so we picked up uh, various hits from this uh, kind of genome-wide analysis and these are the four examples from here and we took the control region where there is no hit and the chromosome numbers are uh, chromosome uh, one and the ID numbers are right here as you can see MSP1 gives a nice peak in presence of beta glucosal transferase in sample uh, in, uh, in, uh, in our test case one two three and four indicating that all the enhancer elements are truly enriched in 5 hydroxymethylcytosine, whereas control regions are absolutely very close to background. So, this is another example. If you are using a HMAD protocol, you want to find, uh, try to validate it, this is another way to go for that. So, using this kit, there is numerous publications now, and here are a couple of publications that I love it, absolutely. So, the technology that I spoke to you just now is essentially uh, covered in the Journal of Biological Chemistry 2011 publication on July 15th. So would you need more information, you can actually look into this particular paper where uh, it is in detail. And the, apart from my lab, this, uh, this particular technology is used in UK in Wolf Reich's lab, Richard Meehan's lab, and in UCL and Steve Jacobson's lab, there are papers in Nature, Genome Research, as well as Genome Biology describing this technology and its application for various biological studies, whether it is in mouse embryonic stem cell or human embryonic stem cells. So, with this, let's uh, try to think about uh, from the local specific to global. Like, uh, suppose you have 20 different samples, you you really want to know, do I want to go for uh, local specific? First and foremost, you can do a quick uh, check whether your DNA has 5-hydroxymethylcytosine or not, because uh, every tissue, every uh, samples could have a differential amount of 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. So for this, we have developed a protocol, and uh, also all these enzymes are available at New England BioLab, uh, and this is a very straightforward, simple protocol I'm going to run you through, and I will show you how we have utilized that to do about 60 different genome analysis, or rather 60 different sample analysis. So in the central of this particular protocol, you have an enzyme called beta glucosal transferase, uh, which will glucosylate 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. Now, this is the enzyme I was talking to you is from T4 phase beta glucosal transferase. This is your typical 5 hydroxymethylcytosine on the left. On the right, with the enzyme, if you put uridine diphosphoglucose, you can see that the glucose residue is actually transferred to this uh, hydroxyl group. So, this is the 5 uh, glucosal hydroxymethylcytosine. And if this residue could be tagged with a fluorophore, or, or with a radioactive label, then you will be able to quantitate. And for all of my talk, all my work in the lab, uh, we have used radioactive glucose, UDP glucose, to transfer a radioactive glucose, and you can measure that by using centralization counter. And once again, this paper is very recently published in biochemistry, and this is the reference on the bottom, and uh, I'm going to describe a few things from that paper now. So. UDP glucose by beta glucosal transferase is a very fast reaction. It's a very efficient enzyme. It transfers in an amazing rate. It, it puts 77 molecules of glucose from UDP glucose on a T4 GT DNA. So the turnover number is 77. That means every enzyme put about 77 molecules of glucose uh, in a minute of the reaction. So you can understand the reaction is extremely fast, and so your 
you can saturate the reaction very, very quickly. So, um, so first thing what we do, we make a standard curve. So what a standard curve, we put uh, a different amount of hydroxymethyl cytosine and uh, this is essentially a DNA. Uh, the DNA is called a T4 phase uh, GT DNA. GT stands for glucosyl transferase mutant DNA. So this DNA, all the C's are hydroxymethyl C. And we do a linear, you will see a reaction is very linear despite increasing amount of hydroxymethyl cytosine and uh, keeping the uh, UDP glucose, radioactive UDP glucose and enzyme constant, you can see the reaction never tapers down even if the HNC concentration is gone to 20 millimolar at this point. And then what you can do is that you can use that standard curve and you have all your DNA samples. As you can see, we have tried a series of DNA samples and you can actually quantitate how much of your DNA has hydroxymethyl cytosine, total percentage of the hydroxymethyl cytosine in cytosine, or you can uh, check it on genome. Once again, this paper is just published and it is, anybody can download, it is openly accessible paper uh, from biochemistry website. And you can see we have looked into mouse embryo, mouse embryonic stem cell, ES cell, uh, cell culture, cell line, different tissue on mouse, brain, liver, kidney, heart, lungs, different cell lines from human origin, U87, 293, colorectal cancer, HCT cell line, then again human normal lung tissue, breast tissue, colon, liver tissue, so uh, as well as the tumors from the corresponding tissue, lung, breast, colon, liver, and metastatic colon tissue, so you can you can see that, and uh, this this is a fantastic technique that works on a variety of tissue. And also, we have tried to integrate sea urchin, a couple of plants here, Arabidopsis, soybean, rice, and various kind of other uh, cells like um, uh, genomic DNA, such as uh, dogs, as well as monkey, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so this is a very versatile technique if you want to look into genome-wide 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And it doesn't take a long time, in probably in one afternoon you should be able to do both the standard reaction and a variety of uh, genomic DNA side by side. So uh, this, is, uh, this is another figure from the paper. I mean, we were also looking at science here. In BioLab, we do a lot of basic research pertaining to this area because we understand that what uh, many of our uh, fellow scientists do in their lab in the academic atmosphere or in a clinical atmosphere, uh, we need to understand them. So we also try to do a lot of a variety of basic research here. And one of the work was to find out if there is a difference of 5 hydroxymethyl cytosine in normal tissue versus cancer tissue. Now, what I am showing you here is essence, basically these are matched tissue. So normal lung versus tumor lung. This is from the same. Uh, patient, uh, so you have match versus normal, breast again match versus uh, tissue here, colon match tissue and liver tissue. As you can see that generally when there's a tumor, you see a decrease in 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. And this is across the board and, and we are pretty surprised and uh, also not very surprised because of the fact that many of the cancer cells have lower amount of 5-methyl cytosine, but this could be something that we have to understand how the role of 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine or what are the roles that plays in uh, various kind of tumor and cancer. So um, apart from these two published, we are uh, very excited that we have some of the very new enzymes that are coming up, which can also interrogate and uh, determine 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine. Obviously, this, many of this stuff is under development now. And one of the enzymes we are very excited is called ABAS1. And this is an enzyme which 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine specific enzyme. It recognizes 5-hydroxymethyl cytosine and excises the DNA. And uh, uh, some of the research is already published in nucleic acid research, uh, just initial characterization in and, uh, and 2011. This is the publication by Wang et al. We are uh, 
very confident that enzyme actually works well because we have some unpublished data on E14 embryonic stem cell DNA from a mouse and we are excited with this enzyme and we will very soon be able to publish some of the uh, information that we have obtained on a genome-wide scale using five, uh, this particular enzyme on mouse, mouse E14 cell lines. So uh, uh, in summary, uh, I think NEB has a, a tremendous amount of uh, basic as well as applied research trying to look into epigenome uh, and develop good kits and reagents so that uh, we can do science as well as help the scientific community. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the people who have helped me to do this work as well as who have facilitated everything, uh, San and Kenny in my lab, as well as uh, 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 Hang Young Chin. They did the work on uh, developing uh, the JBC paper where they have studied the local specific work along with Romus who developed the kit and Ted who uh, spearhead some of the uh, projects here. And I'm very grateful to Stephen e. Jacobson's lab for a lot of me deep data and uh, continuous collaboration uh, on some of the epigenetic studies and the NEB marketing communication department for making the beautiful slides, organizing this wonderful talk and uh, thank you all for being a part of this webinar. And I would appreciate uh, if there is any questions. Obviously, if, you're, uh, uh, if I cannot answer you any question or if you need to know more information, you should be able to send an email to NEB uh, uh, in our website, essentially, so that we will be able to attend to your question. So I will take any question now. OK. Sure, Hasa, you're in for a treat. We have some good ones from the audience. And uh, so to kick things off, we have one question that is um, kind of tactical in nature related to the, the method of uh, sample extraction and the impact on 5 hydroxyl methylcetacine. The, the question is, how stable is, are 5 methylcytosine and 5 hydroxymethylcytosine during cell lysis? And DNA okay, that, that's an excellent question. Actually, 5-methyl cytosine is extremely stable. That's, there is no doubt about that. And 5 hydroxymethyl cytosine is also stable, but in a, in a strong oxidative condition, it can be further oxidized to 5-formal cytosine and 5-carboxy cytosine. Now, does it happen in the environment? I doubt. But if you look into the biological pathway, it can be further oxidized by this test class of protein. So 5-hydroxymethyl uh, cytosine can be further oxidized to 5-formal or carboxy. But if a, if, a, if a scientist is just trying to get the DNA, get the um, tissue sample and trying to extract the DNA, I think it is fairly stable because we have not seen any difference in our one-year, two-year-old samples. So, so I would say, yeah, uh, it is pretty stable for lab conditions. Okay, because this group in particular um, is uh, pretty keen. They've seen cytosolic and nuclear deaminases, particularly cytosine deaminase um, that can deaminate 5-hydroxylmethylcytosine and 5-methylcytosine to 5-hydroxylmethylthymidine and thymidine. And so they were curious if you've ever seen these derivatives in the process in other types of analyses like mass spec. Uh, okay. Now, um, what we have done is that we are using HPLC mass spec. So basically, we take the DNA, we try to make the mononucleoside, and we try to separate them in a microbore HPLC and shoot them to mass spec. We have actually not seen uh, too many things. As long as you uh, store your DNA in a 3CDTA, minus 20 degree, uh, uh, that's where we store our DNA, at least uh, to my knowledge, we have not seen any kind of uh, uh, serious amount of uh, uh, oxidative product coming out of that in a, in a span of six, six months to one year. So, and that possibly there could be some chemical reaction going on, but that's probably so low uh, it's probably not going to be significantly impact the uh, scientific result. But yes, it, it's something one should be uh, concerned about. But if that is, uh, if you are looking at a 
DNA sample which is stored for 10, 20 years and now trying to look into hydroxymethylsilicin. You have to think about DNA damage uh, right then and there. Okay, great, moving on. So here's a more general question. Uh, we had one from the audience. And what's the nature of the tumor, the lung, breast, colon, and liver cells that you used for in the uh, analysis that you presented here? Well, I, <laughs> well, that, that's a question probably I can't even answer because um, most of the DNA samples we get is we obtain from commercial source because we are not a NIH lab here or we don't have uh, uh, the uh, expertise of uh, a, a, a cancer specialist who is micro dissecting the DNA and giving. But what I could just say that they are uh, match versus the tumor and I can't tell you the stage here but uh, in general if, you, if if the scientist wants to know whether the cancer cells have much lesser amount of DNA uh, hydroxymethylcytosin I'll say that's a pretty safe bet but I'm collaborating now with uh, uh, human genetics department in a cancer institute I should be able to get uh, validated DNA samples based on stage of the tumor and that will be very exciting. So I would suggest the uh, scientists to look forward to some of our published results in the future. Okay, great. And uh, here's a more general biology, biological uh, uh, question as well. Are there any studies that you know of that, pro that uh, provide a functional link between 5-HMC enhanced in specific regions of the genome and their physiological implications? So for instance, is there any uh, work out there that ties 5-HMC to mechanisms like transcription or any other regulatory processes? Right, okay. So that uh, paper from Stroud, which is in genome biology, that talks about 5-HMC in the enhancer elements, that's one. And also we know it's in the gene body, especially if you look into Ulf Reich's paper. So to me, it looks like uh, that could be two mechanisms why 5-hydroxymethylcytosin is there. One is it's, uh, it's some way regulating the transcription. Now, whether it is going through a demethylation pathway, which is published, there's a paper in cell now, uh, an apobec-mediated uh, demethylation uh, via 5-hydroxymethylcytosin in the brain. Uh, but once again, this, this is such a new science. Uh, I mean, even the reagents are not there. I mean, that is, it's, it's, I'm sure the scientists, I appreciate this question, but to give a concrete answer now is going to be very hard. But whatever, answer, whatever papers have been published, it does show that there is a role in transcription and based on where it is enriched. If you look into the histone mark, uh, which are four transcriptionally active genes that actually falls with hydroxymethylation mean deep enrichment protocol. So, uh, my guess, as well as the scientific community that are working on, I, we strongly believe it is a transcriptional control mechanism in the cell. Now, could it be a, a disease uh, where the demethylation plays a role? Maybe. Yeah. But once again, everything goes back to transcription, and I'm pretty sure it has a significant role in transcription, as well as development. Maybe some disease like Alzheimer's, but I will not... Uh, put my money down there until and unless I see some papers. Okay, great. And uh, just with respect to the PCR kit for the 5-HMC detection you have, what is the, just from a technical standpoint, what's the lowest input amount of sample that's required to, to run that assay? In my lab, we have typically used between 50 to 100 nanogram of the total DNA per, per qPCR you can go to 10 nanogram, 20 nanogram. We have been very fortunate to get around 10 nanogram. We get very reproducible result. Uh, uh, but if you are looking into how much DNA you should digest, uh, I guess if you have half a microgram DNA reliably, you should be able to do all 100 different kind of things. You can run your qPCR in uh, triplicate or quadruplet. And uh, if you are just looking for a yes or no answer, the endpoint PCR, I think 100 nanogram DNA is going to be way more than enough. Okay, great. Now we have a one follow-up question to one that I asked you earlier around cytidine deaminases and the impact on 5-hydroxylmethylcytosine. And that is, within the context of cancer, 
you think that, is the decrease of 5 hydroxyl methylcytosine tumors could it be due to the increased expression of cytidine deaminases and deamination? Um, or so is it a, you think it's a, a cause, a, a close correlate, or a potential effect at other things like the increased in expression of cytidine deaminases? And that's why this comes from the same researcher that had an inquiry around if you had looked into hydroxyl thymidine with other means like mass spec um, in, in these types of studies. Okay, I mean, um... You, the, I, I guess the uh, uh, cited in deaminase question is, is this, uh, uh, this is the same scientist, obviously, okay. Um, so the answer is that any time you have a higher expression of the mRNA, and if that correlates with the protein and the substrate is there, it can actually remove very, very quickly. So, so you, can get, uh, you can get a higher amount of uh, uh, the uh, the product down there. Uh, but one second, it's like a chicken and egg story. Which one is coming faster? Like whether the hydroxymetal cytosine is coming faster or, uh, or the deamination, uh, what, what is that? The enzymes are expressed in the strong manner. I think one second, I mean, one has to look into the uh, tissue sample in a more detailed manner to understand that. But cancer is a heterogeneous disease again. I mean, it's just each cells are very different in their differentiation stage, so I, I'm afraid I'm, I, I would not be able to speculate too much into that because the, there is no science to explain that, uh, but I, it could be just a speculative answer here. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so we had some great questions uh, from the audience, and uh, Shrihasa, thank you so much for taking the time not only to present, but to have a, a really lively Q&A. So we'd like to thank also our sponsors, again, New England Biolabs. And thanks, of course, to the audience for taking the time out of your day. We all know that uh, you're each very busy. So we take you to take the, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. And if you've enjoyed the seminar and you'd like to view the recording of the session, you can do so by visiting the seminars page on bitesizebio.com. And that's, that uh, recording should be available within the next 24 hours. And there you can also peruse through all the other webinars that they have archived there. And uh, be sure to check back often because they're adding many uh, throughout the year. So until next time, good luck with your research and goodbye from all of us at Bite Size Bio and Epigenie. Take care.